Russia's war in Ukraine continues. Now, Turkey have withdrawn its opposition to Sweden and Finland joining NATO. So, what assessment does my right honourable friend make about the short and long term securities? Keir Stump. Can I start by saying to the Prime Minister that I do know that the relationship between a Prime Minister and Leader of the Opposition is never easy, and this one's proved no exception to the rule. But I would like to take this opportunity to wish him, his wife and his family the best for the future. Can I also put on record our gratitude to the Fire and Rescue Services for all their courageous work yesterday in extreme temperatures. All our thoughts are with those affected by the fires, particularly those that have lost their homes. I join the Prime Minister in his comments about the bombings in Hyde Park and the IRA bombings. I also join him in his comments about the Lionesses. The coverage starts at 7.30 tonight on BBC One, and I'm sure the whole country will be roaring them on. And for anyone who doesn't fancy football, EastEnders is on. So if you'd rather watch outrageous characters taking lumps out of of themselves, you've got a choice. Albert Square or the Tory leadership debates on catch-up. On that topic, Mr Speaker, why... Why does the Prime Minister think that those vying to replace him decided to pull out of the Sky debate last night? Prime Minister. Uh, Well, Mr Speaker, uh, I'm not following this thing particularly closely, but my... My impression, my impression is that there's been a quite a lot of debate already, and I think the public, I think the public are having, they're having an ample opportunity to view the talent, uh, Mr. Speaker. That, that any one of any one of which, any one of which, will, as I say before, like some household detergent, would wipe the floor. Uh, with, uh, with a, I mean, this t- today, today is, happens to be just about the anniversary of, of the exit from lockdown last year. And do you remember, do you remember what he said? Uh, he said, yeah, I'm going to remind him, he said it was reckless. It was because we were able to take that decision, Mr Speaker, supported by every single one of those Conservative candidates, opposed by him, that we had the fastest economic growth in the G7. We're now able to help families up and down the country. If we listened to him, it wouldn't have been possible, Mr Speaker. And I don't think they'll be listening to him either. Well, I'm impressed he managed to get through that with a straight face, actually. Um, I think the truth is this. They organised the TV debates because they thought it would be a great chance for the public to hear from the candidates first hand. Then disaster struck because the public actually heard from the candidates (laughs) first hand. But but I am interested uh, in what he makes of the battle for his job. So let me start with a simple one. Does the Prime Minister agree with his former Chancellor that plans put forward by the other candidates are, in his words, I've got them here, nothing more than the fantasy economics of unfunded spending promises? Well, 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 Mr Speaker, they know all about fantasy economics because uh, they... Committed to £94 billion of extra tax and, uh, and spending, uh, Mr. Speaker, which every household in this country would have to pay for to the tune of about £2,100. It's thanks to the, uh, the former Chancellor's management of the economy, thanks to his government's management of the economy, we had growth in May of 0.5%. We have more people uh, in paid employment than at any time in the history of this country, Mr Speaker. Uh, and I leave, I'm, I'm proud to be leaving office right now with unemployment at or near a 50-year low, Mr Speaker. When, when they left office, it was at 8%. That's the difference between them and us. Mr Speaker, every Labour pledge made under my leadership is fully costed. Those buying, those buying. 
trying to protect him. They, Mr. Speaker, those vying to replace him have racked up £330 billion of unfunded spending commitments. But I do note that the Prime Minister didn't agree with his former Chancellor. So what about his Foreign Secretary? She was withering about the government's economic record. She said, again, her words, here they are, if Rishi has got this great plan for growth, why haven't we seen it in the last two and a half years at the Treasury? That's a fair question, is it, Prime Minister? Actually, Mr Speaker, I think that everybody would uh, uh, agree that what you saw in the last two and a half years was because of the pandemic, the biggest fall in output, uh, for, biggest fall in output for 300 years, which this government dealt with and, and coped with magnificently uh, by, by distributing vaccines faster than any other European government, faster than any other major economy, which would not have been possible if we had listened to him. And that's why, Mr Speaker, we have the fiscal firepower that is necessary to help families up and down the country, making tax cuts for virtually everybody paying national insurance contributions. Uh, the, the difference between La- Labour and the Conservatives, Mr Speaker, uh, there's a crucial philosophical difference. Under Labour, families on low incomes get most of their income from benefits. Under us, they get most of it from earnings. Because we believe in jobs, jobs, jobs. That's the difference, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, inflation is up again this morning and millions are struggling with the cost of living crisis and he, he's decided to come down from his gold wallpapered bunker for one last time to tell us that everything's fine. I am going to miss the delusion. But his Foreign Secretary didn't stop there, Mr Speaker. She also said that the former Chancellor's 15 tax rises are leading the country into recession. Yeah. Yeah. And the That's member okay. for Portsmouth North was even more scathing. She said, again her words, our public services are in a desperate state. We can't continue with what we've been doing because it clearly isn't working. Has the Prime Minister told her who's been running our public services for the last 12 years? Mr. Speaker, this is absolute. And again, he's doing this completely satirical. This is the government. This is the government that is investing £650 billion uh, in infrastructure, in skills, in technology. He talks about public services. What really matters to people in this country right now is getting their, getting their appointments, getting their operations, fixing the COVID battles. That's what we're doing. Fixing the ambulances. That's what he should be talking about, Mr. Speaker. And, and that's why we voted through. That's why we passed the £39 billion health and care levy, Mr Speaker, which they opposed. What, every time something needs to be done, Mr Speaker, they try to oppose it. Now, he's just a great pointless human bollard, Mr Speaker. That's what he is. Mr Speaker, if only, if only it was satirical. It's what the future candidates think of his... Mr Speaker. We want to get through PMQs because there's quite a few of you wanting to catch my eye. It will be more helpful if we get through in order to do that. Keir Starmer. I appreciate they may not want to hear what their future leader thinks of their record in government, but I think the country needs to know. If only it were satirical, Prime Minister. It's what the candidates think of the record. But among the mudslinging, there was one very important point, because the member for Saffron Walden claimed that she warned the former Chancellor that he was handing taxpayer money directly to fraudsters in Covid loans. She says he dismissed her worries and that as a result he cost the taxpayer £17 billion. Does the Prime Minister think that she's telling the truth? Prime Minister, this is one of the last blasts from Captain Hindsight, uh, Mr Speaker, because... uh, at least, to, at least to me, uh, at least to me, because because they were the party. I remember they were the party who was who were so so desperate uh, for us to be uh, hiring their friends with to get to with PPE. They wanted a football agent uh, to supply and a theatrical costumier uh, to supply PPE. Do you remember, Mr. Mr. Speaker? We ha- we had to get that stuff at record speed. Uh, we produced 408 billion pounds worth of support uh, for families and for businesses. 
up and down the country, Mr Speaker, and the only reason we were able to do it at, at such speed is because we managed the economy in a sensible and moderate way. And Labour, every time they've left office, it's with unemployment higher, they're economically illiterate, Mr Speaker, and they would wreck the economy. I think the message coming out of this leadership contest is pretty clear. They got us into this mess and they've no idea how to get us out of it. The Foreign Secretary says we can't go on with our current economic policy. The member for Portsmouth North bemoaned the fact that what we've been doing has not been good enough. And the member for Saffron Walden probably puts it best when she simply asked, why should the public trust us? We haven't exactly covered ourselves in glory. Their words, their future leaders' words. They've trashed every part of their record in government, from dental care and ambulance response times to the highest taxes in 70 years. What message does it send when the candidates to be Prime Minister can't find a single decent thing to say about him, about each other, or their record in government? Mr Speaker, what does it say? What does it, what does it say about him? But no one can name a single policy of the late, after three years of the Labour opposition apart from putting up taxes. He's one of those pointless plastic bollards you find uh, around, a, around a deserted roadworks on a motorway, Mr Speaker. Uh, we got Brexit done. He voted against it 48 times. We got this country passed out of Covid in spite of everything uh, he would have kept and when he would have kept us in lockdown. We're fixing social care, Mr Speaker, when they have no plan and no ideas of their own. And we're now bringing forward measures to, uh, with, in the face of strikes to outlaw wildcat strikes, Mr Speaker. Uh, I can tell you, to outlaw wildcat strikes, I, I, can, tell you why, I can tell you why he does that, that funny wooden <laughs> flapping gesture. I'll tell you why he does that funny wooden flapping gesture. Because, Mr Speaker, he's got, he's a, he's got the union barons pulling his strings from beneath him. That's the truth. Pounds, Mr. Speaker, we've restored our democracy and our independence. Uh, we've got this country through COVID, and I'm proud to say that whether it comes to tackling climate change or sticking up for Ukraine, we have led the world on the international stage. And I want to thank my friends and colleagues on these benches for everything that they have done. Mr. Speaker, in, in September, it will be 25 years since the, anniver the 25th anniversary of the referendum on devolution in both Scotland and Wales. One in 20 people in England and the NHS have been waiting for, for more than a year. In Wales, that's one in five. And school leaders in Wales, 75% of whom say that they don't have enough capital to maintain their existing buildings, regardless of building any others. In his final opportunity at the dispatch box, will the Prime Minister and the Minister for the Union agree that in terms of Wales at least, devolution has been a disaster? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want devolution to, to work, but I think, and I've had some good conversations with Mark Drayford, uh, but the devolved authorities, particularly Labour in Wales, need to do their job properly. Yeah. Now comes to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I join you in wishing all the best in his impending retirement to James Mackay and Beth. He has been a friend to many of us right throughout this House, and we congratulate him for his service. Can I also join the Prime Minister in congratulating uh, Jake uh, Whiteman for his success overnight in winning the 1500 metres at the World Champions? What a fantastic achievement. <laughs> Mr Speaker, this week has seen historic records set across the United Kingdom. But let's look at the Prime Minister's record-breaking efforts in office. His Tory Brexit slashed £31 billion from the economy, the biggest fall in living standards since the 1970s, people's pay in real terms falling at the fastest rate on record, with the worst economic growth forecast in the G20 outside Russia, and the highest inflation in 40 years. Personally, I'd like to thank the Prime Minister in his capacity as Minister of the Union for driving support for independence to new heights. Mr Speaker, Westminster is holding Scotland back. 
The economy is failing and this Prime Minister has driven us to the brink of a recession. Isn't it the case that the Prime Minister's legacy of catastrophic mismanagement has paved the way for the end of the Union? Uh, Mr Speaker, that's not what I uh, observed. And he talks about records. I'll point to the, the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe, lowest unemployment, as I said, uh, for uh, at or near 50 years, the lowest youth unemployment, fastest growth in the G7 uh, last year, in spite of everything. And as for the Scottish uh, national nationalist record, just look at, look at where, uh, where, where they are. They're, I'm afraid to say Scottish uh, school standards are not what they should be because of the failure uh, of the SNP. Uh, they're failing. They're failing. They're failing people uh, who are tragically addict addicted to drugs, uh, Mr. Speaker, in Scotland. And the people of Scotland are facing another £900 million in tax because of the mismanagement of the SNP. I mean, the, the Prime Minister might believe that nonsense, but the people of Scotland don't because they know the reality that our NHS is the best performing in the United Kingdom, and education standards under the SNP are moving in the right direction. Speaker, that's a, that's a good look to the people of Scotland, the disdain that the Tories show for our country. Mr Speaker, I hope that the Prime Minister has time to reflect on his conduct in office with all his new spare time, and I genuinely hope that he finds some peace of mind. The fact is though, that as well as a record-breaker, the Prime Minister is a rule-breaker, illegally shutting down Parliament, parting through the pandemic. Handing out PPE contracts to cronies, yeah. unilaterally changing the ministerial code. Yeah. And let us not forget, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is still under investigation because he can't be trusted to tell the truth. Shameful, disgraceful, and a complete waste of Scotland's time. This is how the people of Scotland will remember this Prime Minister. Isn't it the case that the Prime Minister and his government? should have had its last day a long time ago. Quite simply, Downing Street is no place for a lawbreaker. Well, look, Mrs. Big East, I, I think on the, the points, he's, the personal abuse stuff, I, I think he's talking a load of tosh, but when he's, when he's up, anyways, but when he's up, when he's up in it, when he's retired to the, 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 his croft, uh, <laughs> which may be all too soon, uh, Mrs. Big, I, I hope that he will reflect on his long running campaign to break up the greatest country in the world. Yeah. And uh, I hope he will reflect on the, on the pointlessness of what he uh, is trying to do and, and think instead about the priorities of the people of Scotland, which I think are about all the issues. Uh, that he thought were trivial about their education, about crime, Mr. Speaker, and about the, about the burden uh, of taxation that they are unnecessarily placing on the people of Scotland. Mark well, Longer. A long time ago, when I trained as a pilot, I had the luxury of being able to fly around turbulent storms. And, but what I also had was the ability to, to rely on a team that kept my aircraft airworthy. As the Prime Minister prepares his new fly plans, could I suggest that he might reset his compass to True North and stops off in Dudley, where he will always be welcomed with open arms, with sincere affection, and where he will be able to see the legacy. I thank him for that, that renewed invitation, Mrs. B. I've, I've spent many happy days uh, with him in Dudley, and uh, let's hope that there are more to come. And Davey, as the Prime Minister leaves office, I'm sure the whole House is looking forward to him completing his book on Shakespeare. We wait to read what he really thinks about tragic figures brought down by their vaulting ambition, or scheming politicians who conspire to bring down a tyrannical leader. Right, that of course was the outgoing UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson taking the final questions in Parliament as Prime Minister. Boris Johnson was questioned, of course, amid plenty of jibes from the opposition leader Keir Starmer. Bojo says that he will focus on driving forward his agenda, which is uniting and levelling up, as he says, in the remaining few weeks in office. He was questioned by the opposition leader Keir Starmer and he defended his cabinet's performance in the last few years. There were also attacks flying thick and fast for those who are vying now for the Prime Minister's post.
namely Liz Truss and Sunak were attacked on their policies. In fact, uh, Sunak was attacked for his quote-unquote fantasy economics. We'll, of course, continue to bring you all the updates on the other side of the short break. Thanks for watching. We on World is One.